you know, if you and I had met back when I was a clinical pharmacist working in mm-hmm. the field of organ transplant, and you asked me about natural remedies, uh, you wouldn't have gotten a, a very pleasant response. Sure. You know, I was, I, I often describe myself as like the Darth Vader of natural, oh, okay. at least back then, you know, yeah. so didn't believe in it, didn't recommend it, didn't certainly didn't use mm-hmm. natural remedies. Uh, but it wasn't really until I challenged myself, challenged my own bias about natural remedy sure. and started researching it. And it it's like really one thing led to another. Mm-hmm. And the more I researched it, the more passionate I became and mm-hmm. and ultimately left that career and, and started the company I own now. Yeah. So You're listening to the Nutrition World Podcast, a show about navigating the intricacies of holistic wellness. We're a natural health food store located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we believe that optimal health and peak performance should be accessible to everyone. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. My name is Brian Strickland. I'm the producer. And on today's episode, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Jason Dubois. Jason is a clinical pharmacist by trade and owner of Hybrid Remedies. He formulated some of their flagship products like Hybrid AR and Hybrid CR, which you might've heard about. And they're really focused on allergy and immune support. Um, We actually have Adam Chauncey, who is a staff member here at Nutrition World and clinical nutritionist sitting down with him today. And they're gonna discuss how Jason kind of made that switch from the clinical realm into the natural, which is a really interesting story and something that doesn't really happen that often. Um, And then they're gonna run the gamut of natural allergy relief, uh, individual ingredients that Jason uses in his formulations um, and a ton of questions in between. So thank you so much for tuning in today. We really hope that you enjoy this episode and let's go ahead and hop into this conversation between Adam Chauncey and Dr. Jason Dubois. Um, Dr. Dubois, thank you for flying in. Yeah, no, thanks wasn't for having the, me. No, it wasn't the easiest flight to get in. Of course, I think we jinxed ourselves talking yesterday, but it's fine. I'm um, glad you made it. Um, I'm excited to have you here. Um, uh, obviously, you're a pharmacist, and I'll let you unpack that here in just a minute about what got you into all this. But uh, I'm always excited to have someone kind of outside of the scope of the nutraceuticals that we do who has the standard medical training and everything else, but then also has a extremely high proficiency in the nutraceutical natural world approach. So uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, kind of let us know a little bit of a background. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on today. Mm -hmm. Um, Excited to be here. My name is Dr. Jason Dubois. Mm -hmm. I am the founder and formulator of Hybrid Remedies, a company I started a little over 10 years ago. Uh, The company's based in Jacksonville, Florida. And before I started that company, I was a clinical pharmacist at a world-renowned healthcare clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, my expertise is actually in immunology and solid organ transplant. Oh, wow. Uh, So, you know, I come from a little bit different (laughs) (laughs) angle than probably some of your other guests. Um, Yeah, sure. And uh, a lot of people often ask me, they say, you know, like, gosh, you you were in this field, like the the big pharma world, Mm -hmm. so to speak, and now you're over in in our world here, mm-hmm. you know, you went from like the darkness to the light, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, the irony of the of, of where I am today is like, you know, if you and I had met back when I was a clinical pharmacist working in mm-hmm. the field of organ transplant, and you asked me about natural remedies, uh, you wouldn't have gotten a, a very pleasant response. You sure. know, I was, I, I often describe myself as like the Darth Vader of natural, oh, okay. at least back then, you know, yeah. so didn't believe in it, didn't recommend it, didn't certainly didn't use mm-hmm. natural remedies. Uh, but it wasn't really until I challenged myself, challenged my own bias about natural remedies sure. and started researching it. And it, it it's like really one thing led to another. Mm-hmm. And the more I researched it, the more passionate I became and, mm-hmm. and ultimately left that career and, and started the company I own now. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, pretty that's a little brief snippet yeah. of my journey well darkness can only stay hidden from the light for so long right there you go you know, even darth or even darth vader had a coming out party <laughs> with did. uh get, getting a little bit of goodness in him so that's awesome um yeah it is super exciting to have a pharmacist um coming in and talking about all this stuff obviously um in my opinion being a, a clinical nutritionist and, and talking with so many uh customers on a daily basis and, and uh patients of other practitioners that we partner with uh, most of the time when I'm talking to them about nutraceutical approaches to different um, issues they're having and what they can add to their regimen, things of that nature, um, I am always that person that says, talk to your pharmacist. 
mm-hmm. or find a pharmacist, right. uh, which I, I always, and my practitioner friends and doctors that we partner with don't mind that too, because they'll tell you up front, even if some doctors out there may not, that um, they're not necessarily trained as well in all that, but a, a pharmacist is going to know the ins and outs of every interaction and everything else. Correct. Um, yeah. I think one of the main, uh, one of the easiest ones to kind of tease out is like blood pressure medication and how genetics can play such a role and how that affects certain people. And instead of being on four different ones, you might only need one, but you wouldn't know that unless you're usually your pharmacist is going to say, well, have you talked to your doctor about this? So maybe you could uh, just kind of getting into it. Um, talk to us a little bit about that and why it might be better to talk to a pharmacist over a, uh, a, a doctor or with alongside your practitioner. Just to tease it out. Yeah, I mean, you to stay healthy and, and to do it well, you have to have a good team. Mm-hmm. And one of the great things about a pharmacist is they are uniquely trained in uh, the pharmaceuticals, and mm-hmm. some of them are also trained in, in natural medicine. Mm. Um, and that's more recent. I mean, I'm maybe sure. a little bit ahead of the curve on that because I was researching natural remedies back in early 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my colleagues are now kind of starting to get into that. But a, a good pharmacist, what I like about a good pharmacist is they are well-versed in the mm-hmm. body. They're well-versed in new um, pharmaceuticals sure. and, and to some degree natural products. And they're easily accessible. Yeah. So it's one of the last healthcare professionals that you can you know, walk into a store, a mm-hmm. pharmacy. And if you wait long enough, you can actually have a one-on-one conversation. Sure and get some really solid professional advice. Yeah. Um, just like in any profession, there's some good pharmacists, there's some not so good pharmacists mm-hmm. uh, as far as uh, their their ability to talk to you, but um, find a good one. Um, I often recommend that's a great resource to have on your team, as well as a doctor, of course. Mm-hmm. And I've also been adding things like find a great health food store, right? Find one that carries unique remedies, uh, the best remedies. Um, and then finding nutritionists because all of that works together to create optimal health and wellness. Sure. Well, that actually, um, obviously great advice. Uh, I, I would like to use that as a bridge into, you know, the usefulness and, and utility, I guess, of pharmacokinetics or pharmaceutical mm-hmm. usage and uh, nutraceuticals. So I know a lot of people this time of year, especially in this area, for those not listening in our area, we're in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which... There are two things that happen to us every year. Is one, we never get snow, and then two, we always get pollen. So we we have the highest incidence of pollen, I think, probably in the U.S. It'd have to be close. So speaking on that, obviously, tons of people around here use nose sprays, things like uh, Flonase and Nasacort and stuff like that. A lot of people use allergy medications. A lot of customers use Benadryl, not mm-hmm. only for mm-hmm. for uh, the the antihistamine effect, but also for sleep. And uh, obviously. Um, I'm not a fan of that. I've, I've had to have many conversations with clients about that. But um, coming from a professional, I, I would like to hear it. Um, your opinion on that and where we can start to kind of bridge that gap from things that might be a little more effective even, but at least as effective or a great, uh, a great, uh, that would have a good compatibility with the, uh, the pharmaceutical approach. Yeah. And seasonal allergies are, um, can be a tremendous burden. Mm-hmm. on on people and their lives and their livelihood and um i've spent a great deal of time kind of researching natural remedies when it comes to people getting them the benefit or relief if you will from seasonal allergies mm-hmm. and I, I i ended up formulating a product for that um, but it can really impact people's quality of life um, sure. and a lot of people their initial turn is to go toward the drugs mm-hmm. and i get these questions very often they say what is your thoughts on Claritin, Allegra, um, Flonase is the oh, one yeah. you mentioned, Benadryl. And, uh, you know, those drugs, I can't say they don't work in a mm-hmm. sense, but they do and they don't. Right. Right. So the newer antihistamines, the ones that we see on the TV, like mm-hmm. Claritin, Zyzal, Allegra, mm-hmm. they're very specific in how they work. They, they block a very specific histamine receptor and they do that really really well and so you will get transient benefit Mm -hmm. this temporary relief from the classic allergens uh, of seasonal allergies but that's all you're getting you're really not addressing the heart of the issue and i often Mm. preach about this is that the heart of the issue is your immune system it's your immune system that has really taken something that is 
not harmful mm -hmm. pet dander or tree pollen or grass yeah. pollen and it treats it as foreign and the reaction is is significant um so what i like to do is when i'm helping a client a patient customers i really try to address the immune component of seasonal allergies and not so much sure. focus on histamine and that's what a lot of these drugs actually end up doing gotcha so we might not want to exactly block histamines totally because obviously they do have a, a role to play but we want to modulate or kind of help the immune system work better facilitate a better outcome with the immune response so would that look something like um, a nutraceutical approach something like the product you've uh, crafted i know you, you started a company uh, what was it 2004 well originally well 2004 i started researching researching it. okay 2012 we actually started making products okay yeah gotcha gotcha um, and the hybrid ar this is the one you're referring yes. to in the yellow box mm -hmm. that's our flagship product for seasonal allergies mm -hmm. um and it really comes down to helping the immune system work in a way right that it, it's kind of you're balancing out the immune response because ultimately that's what's going to help your allergies long term sure um the drugs they're very good at blocking histamine mm -hmm. And when you get hyper-focused on blocking histamine, uh, you'll get the benefits from that, but you also get some of the detractors of doing that. And mm -hmm. so some of the things that uh, the drugs uh, are, can create or side effects is, you know, they can be overly drying. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're a contact wearer, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Which I am. <laughs> <laughs> you would be, you know, you're gonna have some additional irritation if you okay. use some of the antihistamine drugs long-term. Hmm. Some of the first generation antihistamines, um, like dipenhydramine, otherwise known as Benadryl, um, they're starting to have reports come out that link it back to uh, memory problems, and in some cases, Alzheimer's. Um, wow. Now we're gathering data on that, sure. um, and they're starting to build cases for that. But you know, drugs are not without their side effects. Sure. And so yes, in some cases they work great, but mm -hmm. they also have side effects. The natural remedies that we use in our products, um, again, help give you the benefit without mm -hmm. some of the harmful side effects. Right, which that's actually somewhat terrifying, the amount of people that come in that use Benadryl on a daily yeah. basis, you know, for either seasonal allergies or just sleep, right? Um, just kind of harkens back to sometimes the root that we have used to develop a lot of these things, which most pharmaceuticals are rooted in a natural, uh, a naturopathic approach. Um, sometimes running all the red lights to get through town is not quite as effective as stopping at each one and letting the systems do its job a little more effectively. So I, I definitely agree there. I, I wonder what are some of the um, nutrients that you typically recommend? I mean, obviously there's a, a bunch in your products um, of which I've used and had great success with, uh, but I also use all kinds of other stuff. Um, what are some individual nutrients that mm -hmm. you really like to either pair with the standard pharmaceutical approach or that you might even like better? So there are some really great ingredients that I've come across in my research that mm -hmm. we do use in our formulas, but uh, I would love to just kind of break these down sure. and kind of get your thoughts on them as yep. well. But I'll just tell you like, for example, like herbs that I love is gonna be things like andrographis, which we use, uh, quercetin, which you and I oh, have yeah. talked about. Um, butter burr is kind of like, um, not well known and i yeah. kind of love that that you know when i talk to people about hey what do you recommend for allergies and i, yeah. I say butterbur they just kind of give me a look like i've never heard of that and well now that's an interesting one if you want to unpack it real quick we because can do i've recommended it for years um, even back when i worked in the mall at a little supplement shop we had it it was one of the util uh, one of the things we used as a uh, migraine kind of mm -hmm. uh, helper yeah um I'd like to know a little bit more of that because I wasn't not aware until I was doing a little bit of research here a while back for a couple of products, including yours, that Butterbur was so potent for uh, allergy help. Yeah, and I was the same in the same boat. You know, I only thought of it as like a migraine benefit type mm -hmm. remedy because that's kind of how it historically came out first. Right. But when I started doing some research, there's a, a unique company out of Germany that creates uh, an, a unique extract version of butterbur that we use in our remedy. Hmm. And the way they extract it, they extract it into a ratio of pedicin and isopedicin. But what I love about that ingredient is they mm -hmm. actually went ahead and did some head-to-head -head clinical trials 
testing it against some of the most powerful um, drugs in the marketplace today. So they did a head-to-head awesome. -head clinical trial against Zyrtec and another one against Allegra. And and these are well-done clinical trials. Sure. So, you know, just to kind of back up, like as a pharmacist, um, my standards don't change. Like when mm -hmm. I'm evaluating literature, whether it be for a new drug or a natural remedy or a natural ingredient, sure. I keep it to the same litmus, the same standards. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about these clinical trials and what really convinced me to use Butterbur mm -hmm. was that they were well done, like randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. Right. In both instances of those trials, they found that the Butterbur was as effective as the as the drugs that they were testing against wow. for seasonal allergies. Wow. Um, and so that's, that's one herb I, I love and I stand by 100%. That's very impressive. So that's... Uh, I've gotten some funny looks before when I've recommended butter burr, so now it's even, I'll probably get more because I'm going to be recommending that a lot more <laughs> just by hearing that because I, I was not aware of all the clinical trials on it. That That's fantastic news, both for allergy sufferers and um, and uh, migraine sufferers too. That, that's really cool. I, I want to know, so on that topic, when you're talking about the drastic amount of research done on things like butter burr, mm -hmm. some of these... Uh, excuse me, some of these other nutraceuticals, do a lot of them have a lot more of these clinical trials, these head-to-head -head comparisons or that you can speak on? So this is where uh, the natural industry is, it, you have to be kind of a, a scientist, a, a researcher, mm -hmm. like uh, y you have to kind of put your investigative cap on sometimes sure. because the, the literature isn't as clear cut as right. you might find in the the pharmaceutical world. It doesn't mean that the information isn't there. You just have to really kind of dig deeper than you normally would. Right. In the example of the Butterbur, the clinical trials were very good, well published. Mm -hmm. um, you can Google it right now and you could research and read the very same trials that I've read. Mm -hmm. um, other instances, you kind of have to assimilate the information. It's there. You have to look at different types of information to kind of to understand how the herb is actually working in the body. So, gotcha. um, but we're seeing it build. Like mm -hmm. I'm seeing better data come out mm -hmm. on natural remedies. Um, you and I were talking about some other natural remedies that right. the data is coming out with more and more. Mm -hmm. um, since the advent of COVID, mm -hmm. um, I, we're actually seeing data come out with certain herbs that have been beneficial in that vein. So yeah. we are seeing better published clinical data. The other area that I'm seeing herbs being accepted, and again, I've been a practicing pharmacist for over 20 years, is... I, I've seen natural remedies being used in, in hospitalized patients. Hmm. And 10 years ago, I would never see that. Now we're seeing like intravenous vitamin C, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing NAC being utilized, high doses of zinc for obvious reasons. So uh, is it where we want it to be? No, not quite yet. Sure. But wow, we've come a long way in a short right. period of time. Well, it kind of seems like, not that history repeats itself, not to, not to quote an old saying that's used quite a bit but you know you look back when homeopathy and all these other things were becoming more popular in the 1800s mm -hmm. and then it kind of got shunned away the advent of the pharmaceutical industry in the 1930s and 40s um we're kind of starting to get back to that which is pretty cool for me to see because a lot of these have been used in many other countries yeah. Um, like the, uh, I believe you're referring to the Myers cocktail yeah. with the vitamin C, the, the steroids and the vitamin Bs. And, you know, it's, it, you would hope it would be kind of second nature to think, well, let's search for a natural approach first. And unfortunately it's just not the case, but it's, it's great to notice that it's garnering such attention, especially with COVID coming out and a lot of remedies that uh, a lot of naturopathic doctors and things have used. And unfortunately we're, were attacked for, but are now kind of getting a little bit of their um, due justice um, with new studies and things coming out. Um, and, and speaking on things like that that are being researched more and more heavily, things that you mentioned earlier, I know you mentioned quercetin, which is extremely popular right now. It is. And it is. Uh, it's something that I've used for years. Um, I actually had RSV when I was a baby and was told that I would have asthma forever mm -hmm. and obviously it was on like the breathing treatments and stuff like that up until i was a, a, a young man and also had a very hard time playing sports and different stuff like that um, as i got older got more active got more into the natural products industry and uh, healthy living in general i discovered things like quercetin just natural allergy relief stuff because that was always what hit me hardest every year yeah. i would have on uh, uh, allergy onset asthma or however you describe it and quercetin was one of the first things i found 
And I noticed that if I stayed on quercetin almost year round, number one, didn't really have any side effects that I could ever tell. But number two, it seemed to help drastically increase my exercise capacity, my breathing seemed to be better and, and things of that nature. I could pet animals <laughs> without breaking out. So uh, why don't you speak on that for a minute? Because I know most of the folks listening probably are either taking it or want to take it. Yeah, we use quercetin. Uh, the data is very strong mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of areas and it's been used for a long time uh, for seasonal allergies. Um, and it also has some other benefits um, as it relates to we talked about the zinc ionophore activity right. properties to it. Um, but I like quercetin. Uh, it, for me, you know, in my research, I found that quercetin comes in a variety of different salts that have sure. different absorption uh, capacities. Uh, so you have uh, quercetin anhydrous, which is the most basic version. You have the dihydrate. You also have uh, uh, isoquercetin. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think one of the other ones uh, was the enzyme modified. Yeah, version it's like the liposomal, liposomal forms. Yeah. Um, and we, I, you know, we use the dihydrate. Sure. Uh, so it's like uh, much better bioavailability than just anhydrous. Right. Uh, isoquercetin is very close. It's actually a little bit better. Okay. It's, it's a lot more expensive. Um, and then liposomal, you know, I think, I don't know how well, but I know it's well it's up there. way up there, right. Yeah. And even with that, you know, speaking on the zinc ionophore, just for folks that don't know, is a way to help force zinc into the cells, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think we were talking about this earlier, it, it's so hard to even take with the um, liposomal form. You do have to take a, a fairly good amount. I think it is around 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams, even for two to four pills, which plenty of people don't mind doing. But I think it's the consistency is mm -hmm. much more the uh, benefit with with question whether it be the dehydrate or the more expensive forms um, just being consistent with it and taking it which is where i always noticed the difference no matter what form i was taking yeah would you agree yeah no totally okay yeah um and you know with quercetin for me like when i develop remedies it's not that quercetin doesn't work or or uh, if you use enough of it you you'll get the benefit mm -hmm. but i like to develop remedies that are more compliant driven. So like mm -hmm. I try to create remedies that are high potency where we can get the maximum amount of active ingredient in one or two capsules. Sure. Um, so my formulation standards are a little bit different than maybe some other practitioners where we're using high, high potency, uh, andrographis, um, higher, higher uh, standardization ratios of like rosmarinic acid, quercetin, things of that nature. Yeah. So that I can minimize the number of capsules that a, that a patient or a customer has to take. It always like, it's always resonated with me as a pharmacist mm -hmm. that if anytime you ask anyone to take something more than once yeah. a day, um, the compliance uh, goes down, like it just right. drops like a rock. And sure. if you ask someone to take something like three times a day, well, forget, forget it. it. Yeah, <laughs> forget it, it's not gonna happen. So For sure. this is why, you know, um, we find in the pharmaceutical world that uh, antibiotics, a lot of people fail mm -hmm. the antibiotic regimen because you're asking them to take it for seven to 14 days, mm -hmm. right? That's a long time. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I could take anything, even if I loved it, I don't think I could take it 14 days consecutively. Sure. Um, and some of the antibiotic regimens, you know, they're asking you to take up to three, four times a day. Right. And you know, like that's oh, yeah. just really difficult. Yeah, um, you forget or something happens, yeah. you lose one, yeah. Um, so I like combining ingredients. So in our formulas, like whether it be hybrid CR or hybrid AR mm -hmm. or our new version EB, I like to use ingredients that kind of touch on different parts of our immune system Sure. Um, in high potency um, formulations. Gotcha. So maybe touch on, you've mentioned Andrographis now a couple of times. Yeah. It's one that I wasn't super familiar with until here recently. And uh, I'd like a little bit more about that. The rosemary acid, which is something I think is really cool yeah. um, to talk on. Maybe yeah. um, unpack some of those other ingredients that you find, uh, not just in y'all's products, but we see them everywhere that people aren't going to be as familiar with as, say, zinc or quercetin right. or things like that. Right. Well, you know, we started talking about butterbur, which mm -hmm. uh, has some great clinicals on it. Uh, quercetin is well known. The one I am most passionate about, and it's really the ingredient that convinced me, convicted me to go into this industry is andrographis. And again, I was studying andrographis back in early 2000 and the data around andrographis is just absolutely outstanding. Some of the, the best clinical trials ever published when it comes to um, colds and flu mm -hmm. 
is with the use of this herb. Um, and there's actually another study, a much larger study done with andrographis and its anti-inflammatory benefits as it relates to um, GI issues like um, mm. Crohn's and, and things of that nature. Um, but I love andrographis because it has uh, great inflammatory properties to it. Um, it, it. It just works really fast. And it's, a, it's an herb that has been highly standardized. So okay. from the clinical trials, we know that there's a key component called andrographolide, mm -hmm. which is what we use in our remedy, that is responsible for the therapeutic benefits of that okay. herb. Um, so I try to look for herbs that where we can isolate specific yeah. properties because you get maximal benefit mm -hmm. and minimal side effects. And um, we use it in all of our remedies. Well, we use it in hybrid CR and hybrid AR. Gotcha. But, um, it's come on strong yeah. in the last year or two. Well, you kind of define it there, but you might mention too, um, I think it's really cool to delineate the difference in the standardized herbs and just the yeah. herb concentrates, which both have their utility, of course. But when it comes to typically affecting change faster and sooner, um, am I correct in saying that you would most often want more of a standardized extract for the particular nutrients? Is, would you agree? I'm a huge proponent of standardization okay. when, when the data is there. Sure. Um, so great example of this is an herb called Panax ginseng. Well-known mm -hmm. herb. It's been around for like 5,000 yeah. years, right? <laughs> so that herb, um, especially in the root, if you, if you really were to dissect it down, there's about 30 plus known properties. So there's 30 ways you can isolate the properties out of that plant. Gotcha. What I like to tell people is like not all of those properties are helpful. Right. Um, and we know like if we use high doses of Panax ginseng um, and use the whole root, mm -hmm. a lot of times you'll get some of the unwanted benefits, right? So people that use Panax ginseng in the whole root form tend to get, sometimes they get anxious or mm -hmm. jitteriness or they get maybe some heart, palpi heart palpitations. Yeah. Um, the benefits of standardization is you're really honing in on the key components of that herb. So you're getting the benefits. Um, and standardization usually is expressed as a percent or yeah. should be expressed as a percent. Um, so for example, going back to andrographis, mm -hmm. there are nine properties in the leaf. Andrographolide is one of those nine. Um, we standardize our, our product to 50% andrographolide. So for every milligram of andrographis, not to get too technical here, sure. but for every milligram of andrographis, the plant, we 50% of that is dedicated to andrographolide. And okay. the reason is because that's where the benefit is. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's good information to have. So um, speaking on the standardization, you mentioned rosemaryic acid. Is yeah. That is from rosemary, correct? Ro you can yeah. get that from rosemary plant, rosemaryic acid, uh, great for, for uh, creating healthy histamine levels. Mm -hmm. um, quercetin has some benefits in that as too. Sure. The other one that I get asked about a lot, uh, and it's not used often, is apigenin. Yeah. Um, I, I came across this herb probably five, six years ago. Mm. There's a lot of great data on, on its uses, but um, the, the information I came across with apigenin mm -hmm. was it, it helps balance out T helper cells. Okay. Or it creates a balance, a healthy balance between TH1 and TH2. Sure. And you might have find that um, real quick, the T helper cells and the difference in that and like the, the yeah. T cells and things of that nature. So T. T cells or T helper cells mm -hmm. are part of your immune response. Right. Um, they're part of the adaptive part of our immune mm -hmm. immunity, and they have a lot of different uh, beneficial effects. So Th1, T helper cells can delineate into Th1 and Th2, and each one of them has very specific roles. Th1 sure. uh, will increase if you are fighting an infection right. or you have high inflammation, uh, whereas Th2 has um, tends to increase when you have issues with asthma as well as allergies. Mm -hmm. um, in those scenarios, uh, people that have asthma and allergies tend to have a higher predisposition to more TH2. The body's making more TH2 to combat gotcha. whatever you're, you're fighting uh, on an allergy perspective. Okay. What apigenin does really well uh, is it balances it out and kind of creates it, brings it back, modulates it, brings it back into a, a more of a healthy balance. Um, yeah. So I always like to recommend apigenin for people that are struggling with seasonal allergies. Mm -hmm. um, 
using it alone, it, it's not going to be enough. Sure. Again, all of these ingredients kind of help each other out right. um, to create the effect that you want. Um, Abigenin, a lot of people say, well, what's it from? Where's it mm -hmm. come from? Is it like moon dust? What is this stuff? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's an extract from the celery yeah. uh, plant or the celery leaf or the parsley leaf. It's like a flavonoid, right? A flavonoid, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's, that's a, actually a good a thing to mention right now is um, we were talking about we were having a – a training a couple of days ago with one of our companies and uh, I always love it when trainers bring this up because I love for the staff to hear it that the the fact that the nutrition of the food nowadays is just nothing compared to what it mm -hmm. was even 30 or 40 years ago because the soil is so depleted where uh, we did a podcast here a while back with Jordan Rubin from mm -hmm. uh, Ancient Nutrition uh, the man who started Garden of Life back in the 90s and uh, he's big in regenerative farming and agriculture and everything now and uh, a little bit of a a little bit of a, a rabbit trail, but it's it's prudent because you go from six feet of topsoil to six inches in under a hundred years. It's pretty it's pretty drastic the amount of nu nutrients that are just depleted out of the soil and thus the plant, right? So it's you know celery juice and all that kind of stuff is fantastic. I think a lot of people can utilize that quite well, um, but it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very low in the concentrations, like you were saying, the standardization of things like this. It's it's very difficult to just eat tons of celery or juice tons of it or eat tons of rosemary and things of this or with quercetin eat tons and tons of apples. You know, it's it's just not quite applicable, especially in an acute situation when you're having a flare up like, uh, you know, if I get too close to a cat, for instance, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to need something quick that's going to affect change and in a few hours and uh, would you say speaking on that it's a good segue to you know a lot of people are going to say listen to this well i want to do the natural approach but does it really work that fast because my allegra will kick in in 12 hours or uh, things of that nature or my zyrtec kicks in within 24 hours um or of course benadryl was fairly rapid onset of course mm -hmm. you're, you might pass out driving so um is it useful to go ahead and maybe say, okay, you can do those, but the nutraceutical approach might work quite as fast, especially in combination with, with these, uh, when you use these nutrients in combination, is that something you would feel comfortable saying? You know, um, that's the goal. Whenever I try to develop remedies, I try to develop remedies that would replace a, a drug alternative. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have like uh, hybrid CR is one of those remedies. Hybrid AR for allergies is, is another remedy that works really fast. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm layering different ingredients to sure. get a faster effect. Um, Andrographis certainly helps with that fast acting effect. Mm -hmm. um, Butterbur uh, is another ingredient we use that promotes the long acting benefit. So one of the things that's unique to our formula is you get benefit within 20 minutes, mm -hmm. but you can get relief or benefit all day with just a sure. capsule. Um, not all remedies can really offer that. They, some remedies just kind of focus on one ingredient right. and like, uh, not to pick on quercetin, but quercetin is good, but it's just one ingredient that works on one pathway. Right. Um, I like to create remedies that work on multiple pathways. Um, going back to the drugs, the drugs do work. Mm -hmm. But again, you, the trade-off is going to be the side effects. Yeah, long-term adverse effects um, can sometimes outweigh the short-term benefit. Sure, sure. So uh, that actually leads me to another nutrient that I really wanted to speak on. I, I didn't mention earlier, and I think it's one that ev I would say ninety-five percent of everybody listening is taking it at one time or another, and that's elderberry, mm. which I know y'all use in one of your formulations, and I've used on and off for years. I've actually used it over Tamiflu many times when I've gotten the flu and quite frankly I think it works better um, not just because the research actually kind of shows that in the head-to-head -head, um, battles they've done over the past few years I think the first one was in 2002 the research study they did on that with uh, Sam Bucus, I believe it was what it was but uh, it's been a fantastic modality for so many people um, we have tons of local people that make it themselves that is, is even better they add stuff like honey to it local honey and stuff like that which is obviously great but uh, what are your thoughts on elderberry and you know is it something that you would recommend for everybody to take or maybe you know i don't necessarily like to recommend it year-round for use um, because i think it is so potent that 
it will work acutely, but you might not want to use it because it's one of these stronger nutrients. Um, so maybe instead of using it year round, you switch back and forth to some of these other options. Mm -hmm. You know, elderberry has been around for a long, long time. Um, and for the longest time, we would often associate elderberry with using it when you have the flu. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the data, the data is pretty darn good. Um, there's actually some very good published clinical trials showing elderberry when it comes to helping with uh, the influenza virus or seasonal flu. Mm -hmm. So very beneficial herb, um, can be used in a lot of different formulations, uh, very pleasant tasting. Mm -hmm. um, all that being said, um, I would agree with you. It's something that you can use short term. Uh, you can also use it through the winter season sure, uh, to kind of bridge that gap. And we saw it play a pivotal role in, you know, this last two years when COVID right. came. Uh, the question I got asked most often when it comes to like elderberry is if it caused or created cytokine storm, storm yeah. right? Um, and man, I had to dig pretty deep on this one. Sure. And, and so I'll just speak from my opinion as a, a clinical pharmacist and as a as a, a formulator of natural products. When I researched elderberry, I did not find a strong correlation or a very, very weak correlation of elderberry causing cytokine storm. Gotcha. Um, would I recommend it in people that are hospitalized? No. Sure. Um, you know, if you have COVID and you're hospitalized, uh, elderberry is, is not going to be appropriate for you at that point. Sure. But when asked directly, like, can it create cytokine storm? I, I do not believe it, it can. Cool. And that's, I'd, speaking from a not doctor of pharmaceuticals, <laughs> I would say I, I didn't see it either. And I, I'm a huge nerd. Um, I, I definitely uh, nerd out on this stuff on a daily basis. And uh, I dug as well for quite a few months trying to find it because we got pressed with that a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it concerned us because we sell a lot of elderberry, right? And uh, I also could not find it. I, I still had practitioners, even in the midst of that, like, full grade medical doctors local that were both partnered with us and not partnered with us still recommending it. Yeah. So it, it, it's great to hear that, you know, from the, from the clinical side that really is just really hard to find that correlational data. And, and, uh, yeah, just to add to that, you know, it does create cytokine release. Right. So, and, and you, you want that, like, that's not a bad thing. Sure. A lot of people think, Oh, we don't want any cytokines. No cytokines sure. are, are important in the immune response right. in getting over an illness. Uh, but cytokine storm, is something totally different. It's it's a it's a hundred x magnifold release of cytokines right. that results in uh, lung inflammation, um, and that's kind of what a lot of people struggled with when they had COVID, the right. early forms of COVID. So um, just just to kind of echo off of what you were saying, is mm -hmm. uh, elderberry does create cytokines, but not cytokine storm. Right. It's still a definitely useful. Definitely useful. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Good to have in your in your. Uh, in your in your home in your medicine chest yeah for sure trying to for figure, sure. figure out a different word for medicine chest Medi yeah in medicine your cabinet in your or natural cabinet natural cabinet natural yeah. Remedy cabinet. yeah <laughs> or as my wife likes to call it my uh, drug pantry because it takes up an entire like half of our <laughs> <laughs> half of our area above our sink um, you know we've talked a couple of times about the research side and you know, the pharmaceutical side versus the nutritional side. I wonder just your personal feelings, just coming from your professional standpoint on the pharmaceutical industry right now. It's, it's a, a little off topic, but it is still fairly relevant, I believe, because you're like, you're saying more and more pharmacists are getting to where they're recommending this more and more doctors mm -hmm. are getting to where they're recommending this stuff more. And, you know, I, I believe that I've seen a you know, number one where I think one of two countries, I think it's us in Canada, are the only two countries that allow pharmaceutical um, companies to advertise direct to consumer right and that's only come about in the last i think 40 years or so so uh, what are your opinions just overall in the pharmaceutical industry and do you think we're moving in the right direction now that we're offering more natural options i do think the natural remedies have gotten better mm -hmm. over the last decade i think the stuff that if we wind back the clock 20 years i don't the things i see today that are in your store today weren't even a, a blip on the radar 20 years ago. Right. Um, so I see that and I, and that is um, come about because we have um, companies that are producing higher quality uh, raw materials mm -hmm. and they're actually doing research on those raw materials sure. and publishing it. So data that um, 
is available to me, you and I now, mm-hmm. Uh, to make decisions on whether a natural remedy works was not available 20 years ago. Right. So I, I see that happening. And, and then the other thing I'll just kind of say is like anytime you see um, the FDA getting involved, anytime you see the FDA commenting on a natural remedy. Like N-acetylcysteine. It, like <laughs> N-acetylcysteine or, or CBD or, yeah. or just anything. Just know that there's two sides to every story right. and one of the things is for the fda to be concerned about something that means that um it could be legitimately because there is a concern mm-hmm. like in the sense of like it could cause harm but also be thinking that there's something to it there's something therapeutic right involved in this right and so if you're being ignored it just means like if your ingredient is being ignored it means that like you're not ruffling any feathers, sure. You, so to speak, yeah. you know. But when you have like big government agencies getting involved mm-hmm. and saying, "Hey, we need to take a closer look at this," sure, then that means something that mm-hmm. that that something something good is happening here. Kind of like what happened with uh, Reddy Strice in the '90s, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when that was really a lot of our listeners yes. might be old enough to remember that. Yeah, Reggie Strice, um, right? But that almost I, th- I know at that time Ed, our owner, who normally does the podcast here, it he was afraid it was going to push the natural products industry out. It mm-hmm. was so drastic. Like, yeah, um, like, lit- like almost like drug bust level type of stuff. And, uh, now we start seeing, we're seeing a lot more of that, not quite as high level, but with like NAC being investigated and, and over the counter question being questioned and things of that nature, especially with the recent influx of interest in that it's just good to see, in my opinion, that a lot more pharmacists and doctors are coming to the, aid of the natural products industry and saying, well, we, we need them to use these modalities. You know, it's not always prudent to just put somebody on a prescription. A lot of times we want to try this or the patient wants to try this first, you know, rather than just have another pharmaceutical thrown at them. Right. Right. And it, it, it should be, it should be that way. Um, um, not all health conditions can be, um, mitigated or taken care of with with a natural remedy but mm-hmm. a lot of times including natural remedies can go a long way right to getting to that point where you need a pharmaceutical so right. i'm a big proponent of of healthy living nutrition sure. which we don't do enough of here in the u.s for sure um and natural products nice well you know we've covered a lot of ground here i, I really like where this conversation has gone just you know in a few closing um topics here uh, what is a couple things i guess I'll, I'll present to you number one um what is your uh opinion well not your opinion what do you use like yourself and what do you put your family on i know obviously you have your own company and right um but what are some things maybe even that y'all don't produce as far as you know modulating the immune system uh, natural products in general that you like for you and your family to have that you keep in your medicine drawer, you know? Yeah. What, you, what do you like? If you came to my house, you'd yeah. see there's quite a few <laughs> in addition to what I have. But uh, I I like some of the core minerals and vitamins. Okay. You know, I and these are things that are, are hip now, you know, yeah. and everyone's using, you know, so I use vitamin D, mm-hmm. I use zinc, um, I use NAC, I use some of the mushrooms, sure. um, the... Uh, um, and then a good multivitamin, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah. You I mean, multivitamins big... work? <laughs> yeah, they, they do. Yeah. Um, That's something we don't hear too much from the uh, the other side of the aisle. Yeah, you know, um, you, won't, you won't get too many buy-ins. You're not just going to pee it one. out, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's what's in my uh, my medicine cabinet uh, in, in addition to my own remedies. Um, recently added, I think, I don't know if I said NAC, but I, oh, yeah. I've got yeah. some NAC uh, now too. So, uh, and then... Uh, every now and then I'll, uh, you know, we've got some, uh, CBD, mm-hmm. uh, formulations as well. So that's, nice. that's what, what I carry. What, what do you, what do you carry over there in your, your house? That's actually, so all of the above, yeah. I actually, I take huge amounts of magnesium and electrolytes. That's actually what I'm sipping on here and there, um, throughout this conversation to keep me hydrated, to keep all these questions flowing, but, uh, things of that nature. Um, I'm obviously big into, uh, athleticism and, and increasing endurance and stuff like that. So I, I love creatine. Actually, it's probably my favorite yeah. supplement is mm-hmm. creatine. Just not only for the beneficial effects of, you know, just muscle building. Right. But it's actually been studied right now for a uh, neurological function and like as an antidepressant and different things like that. It's like, it's really cool stuff. It also is immune modulating, you know, speaking on that topic. 
um, creatine is huge, you know, so I absolutely love that. And then um, all the other stuff, the CBD, we always keep some of that in our drawer. I actually keep uh, oregano no spray mm. up there because uh, knock on wood, ever since I've been using a, a no spray form of oregano um, that isn't too much to kill the microbiome in your nose but it's enough to deter sinus infections. In my opinion, I haven't had one since I've been using it in three years. And I used to be one of these people that had a sinus infection every year. Yeah. Um, I think I was talking to you when we started, I actually tape my mouth every night. That's one thing that I always keep a $5 roll of tape to keep me from mouth breathing because uh, I believe Ed is the one who actually um, coined this phrase, but you should uh, eat through your, you should breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. Mm. So I always try to nose breathe and I breathe better than I ever have. So it, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't even have to be like the strongest, most expensive you know, nutraceutical, right? Like CBD is one of those that's pretty expensive for a lot of folks, but um, especially when you're using it for sleep and different stuff like that, but I, I use mouth tape and it uh -huh. works too. But I'll still use CBD from time to time, of course, <laughs> you know, so all that same stuff you use in a, in a few other modalities, it just goes to show the broad spectrum of um, utility we have with the natural products industry and how, um, how great they work, both in concert with the pharmaceuticals and uh, on their own, mm. you know, I think it's pretty cool. This is a great conversation. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add finishing up here? Because I think I've, I th my brain is rattling right now with this, this information because I, I was prepared for a lot of this, but a lot of this you kind of spurred on me, this information I wasn't yeah, I we, wasn't aware of. It's awesome. A, a, we had a good dialogue that kind of took us all over the place. But just to echo the way we started the conversation, mm -hmm. I'll end it the same way as uh, I would say the best thing that you can do for your health is to uh, find a good health food store, mm -hmm. uh, try to find a great nutritionist and get a pharmacist on your team. And sure. that's a very powerful combination uh, to add. Um, and I, I can't and underestimate any any of those. Um, so all of those can help you. They're all available. You just got to go out there and, and find them. And they're there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We hope to have you back soon. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Right. It's been great. Yeah.